Brought to you by Squarespace. It's late 1944 and Hitler has a problem. The entry of the United States a few years earlier in its previous Lend-Lease program has greatly changed the landscape of the war and not in Germany's favour. The Nazis have found themselves on the back foot and they needed a way to knock the US out of the war and quick. That's where the America Bomber Project comes in. While there were many different concepts proposed, from giant propeller planes to flying wings, it was actually this last one that was truly the most epic for the time, and the most insane. A space rocket plane that could fly 160 kilometers above the Earth and theoretically bomb anywhere at any time. It would have been impossible to stop, and with the right weapon, wipe New York off the map. This is the incredible tale of the newly built, the Silverbird. A space plane at the time was a radically new idea, completely changing flight that had been previously pioneered. For example, this Silverbird wouldn't have even taken off from a runway. Instead, it would first power up along a three kilometer long track with a rocket engine caboose to push the main craft up to 1,930 kilometers per hour before going airborne. So this is seriously the fastest train ever built at this point. Then once the main aircraft was airborne, it would fire its own onboard rocket engine to climb up to an altitude of 145 kilometers. Yes, that's 90 miles straight up or 450,000 feet. At this point, it's a rocket ship traveling at 21,800 kilometers per hour, which would have broken several speed records all at the same time in the name of conquest. But the really interesting part is what happens next. Now, the Silverbird would start to glide back towards Earth and slowly start to re-enter the atmosphere, particularly the stratosphere. The increasing air density would slowly increase the friction on the bottom of the aircraft and in turn generate lift. The result would be something only described as a bounce as the aircraft's speed would rapidly translate into lift and higher altitude, causing the silver bird to once again rise out of the Earth's sky. This process could be repeated again, with the bounce translating into a longer distance traveled. Now, energy can't be created from nothing, and each bounce would be smaller than the one before, but the scientists believed that this range extension would be enough to get it over the Atlantic and complete its mission, dropping a whopping 4,000 kilo bomb on New York. Now, the exact nature of this mega bomb is unknown, but we do know that the Nazis were on the cusp of figuring out the nuclear option. And if the war had dragged on for longer and this project went ahead, it could have been possible that this aircraft carried nukes on board. The Silverbird, now victorious, would continue to bounce and may have even had enough altitude to cruise over the northern Pacific to drop down somewhere in Japan controlled China. The crew would then be taken back to Germany for another mission by conventional means, with the Silverbird being packed up and transported by rail. A total journey of 19,000 to 24,000 kilometers all around the Earth. All thanks to the brilliant design of this aircraft. Back in the 1940s, the Nazis had to go to a lot of effort to get their aircraft over the Atlantic Ocean to reach North America. But you don't need to do that today, not when you can use Squarespace. But before you touch that dial, check out a sneak peek of this bit to see my next video. That's right, if you need a new website, then Squarespace is the best website builder. They have plenty of great templates, or you can have a go building your own design with their powerful, code-free builder. They have built-in e-commerce tech to add products and start selling items right away, in-built email campaign marketing tools to get more customers, and their sites are already optimized for mobile phones, so you don't have to make two. Plus, when you click that link, you're actually supporting Found and Explained by helping fund the animations and the videos that you love so much. So really, it's win-win for both of us. To get a Squarespace website, go to www.squarespace.com found and get 10% off your first site and domain. And become a supporter of the channel and click that link when you need a website. Back to the show. 
The Silverbird was effectively a 100 ton space plane with 90 tons of fuel, 5 tons for life support and another 4 for armament. The front, expected to deal with the vast heat load on re-entry, was not a window but a television. At least some sort of proposed film projector of some description that worked through a rudimentary periscope to give the pilot quite the view of the earth. The pilot's cabin would be for one and it would be pressurized. They would have a storage area for food and water for the long haul trip, but not many other comforts. The cabin would also be surrounded by coolant tubes in order to ensure effective heat management. Otherwise, it would have been an oven on board. The bomb bay behind the pilot would have had room for 4,000 kilos of weapons, and each bomb could be controlled via remote television to its destination. The accuracy and the technology required was doubted, but the Nazis were pretty happy that the bomb would land somewhere in the region of 400 miles to its destination. There would also be a tricycle landing gear that would be used when it arrived in Japan, and the space plane would also have a simple flight control surface to steer it as it came in. Now in my notes, I couldn't exactly find any sort of parachute system or ejection system for the pilot, so you gotta believe that the pilot was very brave to get on board. But perhaps not as brave as the man who came up with the idea. Our story of this madness actually begins back in 1942, when the Nazis needed to figure out a solution to their age-old enemy, the Atlantic Ocean. America, who had just entered the war, had its industrial base located far away from the front lines over the sea, and the Nazis needed a way for their planes to get there. The Nazis dubbed this program the America Bomber and issued a notice to their top engineers and aircraft firms to come up with a new aircraft that was up to the task of the savage mission. But it's not our gang of usual suspects like Messerschmitt or Junkers that are the center of attention this time round, but rather a rocket scientist by the name of Eugene Sanger. Sanger was a brilliant rocket scientist who had previously rose to fame before the war with his theories of using rockets to punch through the atmosphere. His work was so prolific that he was alike to Von Braun and was recruited into the same Nazi war machine. Ironically, this would become a deep rivalry, but we'll get to that later. During the development of various V1 prototypes, such as the A7, he realized that if the rocket entered the Earth's atmosphere at a specific angle, it would bounce off the increasing atmosphere, much like a pebble does off the surface of a lake. And perhaps even those bounces could be translated into further distance, the very basis of the Silverbird. With this idea, in December 1941, Sanger sent his proposal for the suborbital glider to the RLM under the proposal of rocket propulsion for long-range bombers, seeking a substantial sum to build a prototype. Alas, the 900-page proposal was regarded with disfavor from RLM due to its size and complexity, and the fact that the war was heating up in a bad way for Germany, the powers that be parked his proposal. They needed results yesterday, and were looking for a new type of aircraft to simply win them the war. But that didn't decide Zanger, and he went back to the drawing board. Working with his wife, who was also a famous rocket scientist called Irene Brett, they worked around the clock and came up with a workable 400-page plan of a rocket plane, the Silverbird that we know today. They set it out to all the famous Nazi names, Von Braun, Messerschmitt, Heisenberg, Fokker-Wolf, Heinkel, and Professor Dorner himself. The report detailed two manned and one unmanned version, and they were called the Antipodal Long Range Glider and the Intercontinental Long Range Glider. And I'll let you pronounce those names in German back at home. The report was so controversial that the German government hid it from everyone without top secret clearance and put it in a safe under guard for 24 hours a day. It seemed like only a moment was wasted before they got to work to build this proposal. Well, not really. What happened? 
You see, by 1945, the war was going pretty poorly for Nazi Germany, and Sanger and his fellow rocket scientists realized that it would be better to delay the launch of these new superweapons rather than complete them haphazardly. While working on various ramjet engines, Sanger and Brett were moved deep into the Alps, where one day they simply stood up from their workshop, walked out together over a mountain pass and into the waiting arms of the US troops, effectively defecting in order to avoid the approaching Soviets. And speaking of the Soviets, that report that they wrote that was 400 pages long a year before would very quickly come back to haunt them. The Russians managed to raid several aircraft factories by this point of the war and acquired the document detailing Sanger's proposal. Stalin quickly grew very interested and requested a meeting with his secret police and the Politburo. In part, they discussed while the V-2 design captured from von Braun was interesting, it didn't have the range to attack anyone but Poland. They would need something like the Silverbird to combat America. And in order to build this Russian version, why not get the team that was going to build the Nazi one? Sanger and Brett. Stalin made his mission such a top priority that he sent his son and several agents to France to track them down. Eugene Sanger and Irene Brandt had both been recruited by the French Air Ministry to develop a supersonic fighter, and thus were protected by French counterintelligence. In a stroke of luck, the French managed to hear about this plot beforehand and moved them both at midnight, hiding them away in a farmhouse as the Soviets sought in vain for their location. And in a twist of fate, around about this point, it actually turns out that Sanger and Irene had feelings for each other. I'm not actually making this up, and this is me uh, jumping in during the edit to change this, but I read about that they actually ended up getting married and falling in love, which is absolutely kind of a nice, wonderful spin on a story about a Nazi death machine. Developments in jet engines from this point and the creation of the ICBM eventually made Stalin forget about the project, saving Sanger and Irene's life. Sanger would eventually return to the new Western Germany where he and his wife would work on various space developments and even came up with the idea of solar sails to visit other stars. A legend for sure. As for the Silverbird, the work wouldn't go to waste and eventually its concepts were implemented in the space shuttle for NASA. So the question that you must have at the edge of your lips after watching this last 11 minutes and 49 seconds is what if the Silverbird actually worked for Nazi Germany? Well, kind of. You see, the post-war analysis of the Silber Vogel design involved a mathematical control analysis unearthed a computational error. It turns out that the heat flow during the initial atmospheric re-entry, the first bounce, was much greater than calculated by Sanger and Brett. Hence, if the design had actually been constructed, it would have been utterly destroyed by the heat, which would have exceeded the design limits and melted the craft. Of course, the problem could have been solved and removed by augmentating the heat shield, much like that we saw with the space shuttle, but this would have reduced the craft's payload capacity significantly, reducing its use for the intended mission of destroying distant areas. So it's very possible whilst they could have created a rocket ship space plane, it would have only been used for science. Which is not really a shame, because I think that's the best use of this technology. So as it turns out, it was hardly the doomsday weapon that they all thought, and had it been built, it would have been a total waste of resources for the Nazis. Which I think at the end of the day, is a fantastic end to this tale. Thanks so much for watching.